Hey y'all, Dixie here. In this two week back to the basics of backpacking series, I have talked about a lot of gear. And with all of this gear, if you go backpacking, you have to have something to put it in. So today I wanna to talk to you about picking a pack to go backpacking. One of the first things that should be considered when shopping for a pack is the volume of the pack. So this is how much space you have to fill up with your gear on the inside of the pack. This will really depend on how many days you're aiming to be out backpacking, so how long your trip's gonna be, and then how big, as far as bulky and heavy, your gear is. My best advice for somebody who's currently shopping for a pack, just so you know that all of your gear will fit inside, is to take all of your gear with you to a store where they sell packs and practice kind of packing different packs with different volumes to see what works best for you. As a bit of advice, I would say when you go in there and pack all of your stuff in the pack, if you think, well, I might go one size up really from what I need just to have some extra space just in case, I think that in most instances that might be a good idea, but with packs, you're then carrying the extra weight of the pack, like the pack itself, because it's bigger than you need. And then you'll be more likely to cram a few more things in before you go on your trip because you have this extra space, so why not fill it up? So really try to go with what you think will fit your gear kind of perfectly and not get something that's a little bigger just so you have the extra space. I feel like most beginning backpackers aim for the range of 50 liters to 70 70 liters for up to five day trips. Of course, men's clothing is gonna be a little bit bulkier than women's, especially if you're bigger and taller than you know a short, slender woman. So you might wanna adjust some of that, again, to your specific gear. But that's the range that usually works for people when they're first starting out up to five days or so. Anything bigger than a 70 liter pack is probably gonna be considered in the expedition pack range. So this is for trips that are gonna be potentially a week or longer, and maybe even for people who are doing doing some winter backpacking because they're gonna be carrying more heavyweight gear and probably more layers to keep warm. Next, let's talk about weight. Not just the weight of the pack itself, but also the weight that the pack is designed to carry. It seems that the heavier a pack is itself, the more weight that it can stand to carry. Also, comfort plays into this. So the pack that I carried on the Appalachian Trail, which was an Osprey Aura 50 liter, was about three to four pounds as far as the pack weight itself. But the pack that I carried on the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trail was only a pound and a half, and they actually make a lighter version of it. I carried the Z-Pax Arc Hall because it was designed to carry up to 40 pounds, but the 21 ounce Arc Blast is designed to carry up to 35 pounds. I knew that I would be having longer water carries, so I wanted to have more water holding capacity, and I wanted the pack to be able to hold up to carrying those heavy weights and not tear up quickly. The pack that I carried on the Appalachian Trail definitely could have carried up to 40 pounds also, and I think that there were times when I was carrying a lot of water that the Osprey Aura would have actually carried the weight more comfortably than the Z-Packs Arc Hall did, but that's a trade-off. So overall, the gear that I had and everything was more lightweight and the pack itself was more lightweight, but there were times where it probably did not carry as comfortably as the Osprey R did. So with volume, it's important to consider how bulky your gear is, but you have to also consider how heavy that gear inside your pack is. So while an ultralight pack that might have a 55 liter capacity might carry all of your gear as far as fitting it in there, it might not carry as comfortably. So when you look at ultralight packs, you definitely wanna make sure that your gear that you're carrying inside of it too is pretty lightweight itself. So just be leery of that because it could be real easy to look at a pack weight and go, of course I'd rather have a pack that weighs a pound and a half instead of three or four pounds, but it's important how comfortable you're gonna be while you're carrying that weight. Another factor to consider is durability of your pack. Are you gonna be going through brushy areas where you constantly have briars and twigs snagging at your pack? Are there mesh pockets on the outside that can be damaged easily? Or are you gonna be traveling through areas like the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, Continental Divide Trail, Colorado Trail, all the trails that have a lot of traffic and more trail maintenance where you're not gonna to have to worry about that and a mesh pocket or other more fragile components of the pack would be okay. Just something to consider. It's also good to consider what material is my pack made from. 
A lot of lightweight packs today are made out of nylon. The packs that I prefer, the more ultralight packs, are made out of Dyneema. Now, nylon is fine. The pack that I used on the Appalachian Trail, the Osprey Aura, was made out of nylon, but it was not a waterproof material, so I had to make sure to use a pack cover and also line my pack with a compactor bag. Now, the pack that I carried on the PCT and the CDT was made out of Dyneema, which is pretty much a waterproof material, but I still took extra redundancies to line the pack with a compactor bag, just in case my pack were to get a hole in it. Other than the extra redundancy of having a water waterproof layer. I think having a pack made out of Dyneema is great because it doesn't soak up water like my nylon pack tended to, so I don't have that extra water weight weighing me down after I've already been trudging miles in the rain. You may hear people refer to your pack's frame. Most packs either have an external frame, internal frame, or they are frameless. External frame packs are really kind of a thing of the past. There are still applications for those if you're really carrying some heavy loads, but with the newer technology of gear and things just getting more and more lightweight, they're really not a necessity in everyday normal backpacking. The internal frame pack is more common now in backpacking than any other type of pack, and it's just what it sounds like. The frame is internal and it kind of hugs to your body inside the pack. There is such a thing as a frameless pack, and this is just a pack that does not have a frame. For the most part, these are very ultralight packs with folks who are toting only the bare necessities to get by while backpacking. And this is something that people don't generally start off with. It takes more experience to really learn what you need out there and to carry a load that's light enough to go in a frameless ultralight pack. Some of the features to consider when selecting a pack are ventilation. On the Appalachian Trail, the Osprey pack that I had had a mesh back to allow the pack to not rest directly on my back, but the mesh did instead, which allowed some airflow so my back wasn't just extremely gross and sweaty. And not only just the discomfort of feeling gross and sweaty, but also if you have a pack that rests directly on your back and doesn't allow much aeration, it could cause chafing or rubbing. It's really gonna depend on the individual. The pack that I carried on the PCT and CDT, the Arc Hall, also had a little arc with some mesh to allow my back to get that aeration. Now. For almost a thousand miles on the PCT, I had the HMG Southwest pack that did sit directly on my back. It didn't have any kind of ventilation or mesh to help with that. And while this is definitely not a deal breaker for me, uh, it is nice to have some ventilation and might be something if you're a sweatier person and you would enjoy more aeration that you want to consider when buying a pack. And mesh isn't the only type of ventilation. You might also notice that some of the padding on the back area of the pack might have breaks in it to allow airflow too. Access. Some packs are top loading, others have panel access, or you might even notice a sleeping bag access point on the bottom area of a pack. Myself, personally, I like top-loading packs just fine. They can be a little less convenient when trying to access your gear on the inside, but if you're going to have anything like a pack liner or a compactor bag, then those other points of entry might not really work out anyway if you have most everything inside that compactor bag that you don't want getting wet. Also, I personally don't like the idea of zippers to access the inside of my pack simply because I feel like that's something else mechanical that can fail. I haven't ever heard of anybody that had a pack that zips up having any issues, but for me personally, maybe I'm just a worry wart. I just think that that's something to think about before going, oh, this is a wonderful idea, and then ending up with a zipper that won't zip shut. And I generally don't put things that I wanna access in the middle of the day at the bottom of my pack, but we'll go over that a little bit later when we talk about how to pack your pack. If you're just starting in the world of backpacking, you might not know yet exactly what pouches and pockets that you would like on a pack. But if you can, while you're test driving it in the store, kind of think about what would be convenient for you and what you might want to access while on trail. For example, I like having big enough hip belt pockets to put my cell phone in because that way I can easily access it while I'm hiking because my cell phone also acts as a camera. You might also want snacks in your hip belt pockets. Because I no longer use a hydration pack, so I don't have a tube that comes over my shoulder to drink water out of, I like having the little cup holder pouches on the side that are big enough to hold a couple of smart water bottles or a smart water bottle and my umbrella 
or a trekking pole while I'm using my umbrella. So just some of those things that you want to think about when you go to pack your pack, what pockets and pouches might be convenient for you. I also like having a big, I call it a back pocket, but the pocket that's big on the outside of the pack, I guess it's actually the front pocket, but because it's behind me, I call it back pocket. Either way, that big pocket on the pack, I like having that to stuff my rain gear inside of, also my toilet paper and baby wipes, just things that I want easily accessible while I'm hiking in the middle of the day that I don't have to open up my pack and dig gear out. And I can just set my pack down and easily get it out of that back or front pocket. Some packs have a brain, also known as a lid, that can be removed and used as a day pack. I myself look at this as an item to take off the pack to save weight. By taking it off of my pack that I used on the Appalachian Trail, I think I saved almost a pound of weight just in the weight of the lid or brain itself. But if you do need this extra space, then it is convenient to have things easily accessible, again, right there on the top of the pack. And bonus points if it doubles as a day pack because then you're purchasing a pack that you will take on backpacking trips, but also one that has the little lid that you can use as a day pack. So it's kind of like two in one. Hydration reservoir. You may want a hydration reservoir if you're going to be using something like a bladder and a tube to get your water through. So you would put your water bladder in the hydration reservoir and then the pack will have a hole in it to feed the tube through so you can clip it on your shoulder strap and just easily drink out of it. I got away from the system myself because I prefer using a Sawyer squeeze that can screw directly onto a smart water bottle, but it's all about personal preference. I have to say though, even when I used a pack that had a hydration reservoir, I did not use it. I did use the hole where the tubing ran through, but as far as the pouch to put my water bladder in, I just felt like if I used that, then my hose tended to get cramped up on my other gear. So I carried the bladder on top of the rest of my gear. But the hydration reservoir could work for you depending on the rest of your gear and the way you pack your pack. Padding. Of course, my first thought is, yes, I want all of the padding all over the pack. But with more padding is going to come more weight. And typically, ultra light packs are not going to have much padding. There will be ones that you can customize, like the Z Packs Arc Haul I had. I got a lumbar pad. But I would recommend to make sure that you have padding in the areas that you feel like your body is going to need it most. And then in the other areas, maybe opt for no padding just to save a little weight of the pack. And that will be something you learn as you go because if you end up with a pack that's not padded properly in areas that you need it, it will let you know. If you buy your pack from REI, if you have one nearby or even online, you have up to a year to return the pack, even if you test it out and it does not work for you. So if you're not 100% happy with your gear from REI, they will refund you up to a year after your purchase. Gear loops. If you're gonna be carrying something like an ice axe or trekking poles and you think that you might want some kind of loop to carry those at certain times then that's something to look for on your pack again for folks just getting into it i'm thinking that you might not need an ice axe immediately but if you're going to be carrying some other tool that you'd like to have a gear loop for that's something to keep your eye open for when selecting a pack rain cover some packs come with a rain cover if they are not made out of waterproof material some packs do not come with them even if they aren't made out of waterproof material a rain cover is certainly something that can be useful for repelling water away from your pack but i would not rely on this as your sole method for waterproofing the gear in your pack because i found that even with having the pack cover on water was able to seep through that my pack was generally soaked, but the gear stayed dried on the inside as long as I took other measures to make sure it did not get wet. Overall, when thinking about features that you want on a pack, I would try to find a pack that has the features that you do want and feel like you need or will make life easier while on trail. And then the ones that you don't really need, if you can pick a pack that kind of opts out of those features because with added features comes added weight. Something that most people consider while buying a pack is the price. It's not out of the ordinary to pay two to $400 for a good backpacking pack. You can look at getting a used pack if you're on a tighter budget. There are a lot of groups on Facebook where people buy and sell used gear. Also, REI does 
garage sales, sometimes they'll have somebody return a pack that was gently used and didn't work for them, so they'll sell it at a discount. A good pack should last you for years, so it's not like you're spending hundreds of dollars on something that you're only going to use a few times. And you can also look into the brand of pack that you buy and see what kind of warranty they have or guarantee. Osprey, for example, has a wonderful guarantee. They will repair any kind of defect or damage on a pack at any given time if you have the pack. So even if you bought the pack in 1974, they will honor that and repair any kind of damage or defect for you. I think one of the biggest things to consider when buying a pack is how comfortable the pack is. And to make sure that it's gonna be as comfortable as possible, it's a good idea to go into an outfitter, either your local outdoor store or an REI, and get properly fitted by somebody that knows what they're doing, that can add weight to the pack and allow you to walk around the store and get a good feel for how it would be if you're walking down trail with some weight on your back. You need to know that the pack fits your specific torso length. It has more to do with your torso length than your height in general. Your torso length is measured from that bump on your neck where your neck connects with your shoulders and then to the iliac crest. So if you slide your hands down your rib cage and rest on your hips, if your thumbs are behind you and pointing towards each other, then that imaginary line that's created there, you wanna go from that bump on your neck down to the center of that imaginary line and that is your torso length. Some packs will fit based on a torso length range, so it'll be like a small, medium, or large, depending on your torso length, and others will have an adjustable suspension, so it can adjust to fit you more specifically, depending on your torso length. And some might even have a combination of the two. Your waist size will also be important because you want the hip belt to fit you properly, so there may, again, be some sort of range in the pack as far as sizing goes with small, medium, or large, or some packs even have an interchangeable belt. So for example, the Z-Pax pack that I have allows for interchangeable belts. So while I might be a medium, if somebody else wanted to use my exact pack and the length of the pack worked for them, then they could use a bigger or a smaller hip belt and use the same pack. While some packs might come in a one size fits all for male or female, some brands also have female specific packs or male specific packs. The female packs tend to have smaller frames and the hip belt and shoulder straps are generally more contoured with the female figure in mind. Same thing with youth specific packs. Some of them have adjustable suspension with a growing child in mind. Now, this does not mean that women have to wear women only packs and men have to wear men specific packs. In fact, when I was picking out my first pack, I had gone through all of the women packs that I saw in REI and I was on the last one and if that one didn't fit, I was going to start going to the men's packs and trying those on to see if they didn't fit more comfortably. But the last women's pack worked for me, so I do have a women's pack. But again, don't be limited to, you know, if you're female only going with female packs because you might find that a male's pack fits you better. And same thing with men. I've known men who found a good female pack on discount and they ended up trying it on and it seemed to fit them fine. So I've seen men wearing female packs. It really just depends on your body and how the pack fits you that's most important. Once you find a pack that has all of the bells and whistles you're looking for and it seems to fit you pretty well, then you can tune specifically to fit the pack to your body using different straps on the pack, including the hip belt, shoulder straps, load lifter straps, and the sternum strap. First, you wanna adjust the hip belt and the shoulder straps kind of together until you get them right, and then move on to the load lifters and the sternum strap. The hip belt should rest on top of your iliac crest to allow most of the weight to be on your hips. If you find that the hip belt isn't hitting right on top of your iliac crest, then you can adjust the shoulder straps up or down to raise and lower the hip belt onto your hips. Your hip belt should fit firmly, but you shouldn't notice any pinching on your hips. And it's best if the cushion extends a little bit past that front point on your hips. Also, you should have at least one inch of clearance on either side of the buckle just to give yourself some wiggle room on how the hip belt fits. To tighten your shoulder straps, you wanna pull down and back on the loose ends of the strap. You shouldn't notice a whole lot of weight on your shoulders because again, you want most of the weight to be on your hips. Putting too much weight on your shoulders can strain your neck and your back. 
The shoulder strap anchor point should be an inch or two below the top of your shoulders. If it isn't, your hip belt might be at the wrong level or the torso size for that pack might be off. Again, you wanna play with the adjustment of your hip belt and shoulder straps until they feel comfortable for you. And then it's time to move on to the load lifters and the sternum strap. Load lifters are the straps that connect the top of the shoulder harness to the back panel. And they should sit at about a 45 degree angle when tightened. Most packs are gonna have load lifters, but some ultralight packs do not. And finally, the sternum strap is the strap that comes across your chest. Usually they're adjustable, so you wanna slide it to where it's about an inch below your collarbone. You wanna buckle this and tighten it to give your arms free range of motion, but you definitely don't wanna tighten it too much because it could cause some pinching or discomfort. You probably won't get the fit of your pack perfect the first time, but with time and experience, you'll get better at this. Now you've got all of your gear and you have your pack. You're probably wondering, well, how am I supposed to put all of this gear in this pack properly? It's recommended that your less frequently used gear, so maybe your sleeping bag or your sleeping pad, if you have an inflatable one that can just fold up or roll up inside your pack, those things generally go at the bottom because they're not used during the day. So it makes sense to not have them in the way where you're having to access something that you do use a lot at the bottom and pull everything out of it. So those less used gear items stay at the bottom until you get to camp. In the middle goes your heavier items because this creates the best center of gravity for not throwing your balance off while backpacking. Maybe your food, water, cookware, or other heavier items. And then your more frequently used items are gonna go towards the top or maybe more lightweight things. So some people even store their tent at the top because they like when they get to camp that that's the first thing that they pull out of their pack and set up and then everything else goes inside of it. Or some people just connect their tent to the outside of their pack. It's really all about personal preference and you'll figure out what works best for you and your specific routine. Just keep in mind that if you're able to keep the heaviest items towards the middle of your pack and closest to your back, without having lumps that make you real uncomfortable, then it's gonna put less strain on your hips and less strain on your neck and shoulders. Anything that you're going to want to access quickly and easily during the day, like I mentioned before, rain gear, I always put in the big pouch on the outside. Also, I see a lot of folks put camp shoes like sandals or Crocs inside there. That way, when they stop and take a break in the middle of the day, they can allow their feet to air out and quickly access those camp shoes. Also, toilet paper, baby wipes, or anything else that you might need for when nature calls. And then I like to keep my water bottles with my filter attached in those cup holders on the side. And again, usually I'll put my umbrella there or a trekking pole when I'm using my umbrella while hiking. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today on packs and the basic rundown of what to think about when purchasing your first backpacking pack. If y'all have any questions on the things I talked about today, like the features or how to pack your pack, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. And for you more experienced folks watching, I know I always kind of leave you with a question to help the newer people. So today I wanna to know what is your favorite pack that you've used and or if you're willing to share how you pack your pack and why that works best for you and your routine. Tomorrow's video will be one little extra video for the two week series and it's gonna be on backcountry camping basics and leave no trace tied into that. So for those of y'all who feel like you've been having kind of a Dixie overdose, we will go back to the one video per week on Wednesdays after this week and the video that comes out tomorrow. Thank y'all so much for watching and if you found this video helpful or you enjoy the content of this channel do not forget to subscribe and we will see y'all next time